You're listening to the Talking Headways Podcast Network. This is Talking Headways, a weekly podcast about sustainable transportation and urban design. I'm Jeff Wood. This week, Angie Rivera Malpietti, board chair of the RTD in Denver, talks with Cindy Chavez, former board chair of the VTA and current Santa Clara County supervisor. These Latina leaders chat about getting communities involved in transportation and leadership. Stay with us. This podcast was produced by Railvolution, edited by The Overhead Wire, and appeared first on the Railvolution podcast. You can find the Railvolution podcast on your podcatcher of choice. For a deeper dive on livability issues, or if you want to check out the annual conference in October, visit railvolution.org. That's railvolution.org. Today's podcast is brought to you by our generous Patreon supporters. Thanks so much for supporting each month. We couldn't produce this show or Mondays at the Overhead Wire without you. To join this merry band of dreamers, go to patreon.com slash theoverheadwire. Support at $2 a month and we'll send you some stickers and a handwritten note. At $10 a month, we'll send you our famous bus-only scarf. Throughout the pandemic, you all have been super supportive, and we really, really appreciate it. Today's podcast is also brought to you by the projects of The Overhead Wire, sharing information on cities around the world with our readers and subscribers. Join us and try our one-of-a-kind daily newsletter for two weeks free. No credit cards, just an email address by visiting theoverheadwire.com. We've got 71,000 news links in our archive tagged by topic, so sign up and search away. And finally, we'd be remiss if we didn't mention our audiobook version of Raymond Unwin's 1909 classic, Town Planning in Practice. Go to RaymondUnwin.com to find out how you can download the book in your podcatcher and listen to each chapter like an episode of the show. We have a free Word document with timestamps on the site as well. Listen, thank you all for inviting me. And Cindy, it's such a pleasure to be sitting across from an such an extraordinary Latina leader, so I'm pleased to be here. Um, my name is Angie Rivetta Malpietti, and I am honored to be serving as the chairman of the board for the Regional Transportation District, which is a transit agency in the Denver metropolitan area. And in fact, RTD is the 16th largest transit agency in the country. I'm also very honored to be the first Latina to ever hold this chair, historically number one. And number two, as of Tuesday night, I was voted in for a second term as the chairman of the board. So I am extraordinarily honored and pleased to be leading this agency. This is an extraordinary agency. Um, I'm going to brag a little bit. We last year for the first time uh, hired our first female general manager who is a woman of color. And for the first time in 52 years, RTD will be led by a Latina and a black woman, which I think is extraordinarily exciting for our region. And then, you know, the question about how did I get to this place? I I think, you know, this has been my life's journey. And, and Cindy, I don't know about you, but everything is built on each other to get to this point. I am the vice president of a foundation for urban sustainable communities. And I am also a, um, an executive director for a transportation management association called Northeast Transportation Connections. But my background is in community advocacy, and I've done it for a very, very, very long time. And what I've learned is that all of my experiences prepared me for this position that I'm in right now. All of my life's journeys, all of my career's journeys, and I will tell you, I grew up in, um, in a struggling Latino family. I'm one of eight. Uh, we were trans independent. So I grew up uh, riding the bus in this community for the last 50 years, which is really kind of mind blowing to use those numbers. But um, as chairman of the board, I know intimately the history of the transit system in this community. It's my community. Um, I have worked in nonprofit organizations in literally every demographic you can think of. And one of the things that I've learned is that I am this community. And when I sit at the chair making decisions, I know exactly how people feel. I know what their fears are. I know what their dreams are. And I know the importance of transit for them and their families. And so I bring a real unique perspective to this transportation board. Um, And the other thing I will tell you is I did it all through volunteering. And people say, really? Yes. Volunteering is what got me to all of my goals. 
that I was able to achieve. I was a single mom, raised two daughters by myself. Um, I was working three jobs, but I was volunteering with them in tow, uh, learning about my community, advocating, learning the issues, experiencing the hardships. So when I sat at those tables, people listened to me because I was the touch point they didn't have. And that's what I bring to this chairmanship and this board of directors is I have the voice of the community with me, of the disenfranchised communities that really struggle. And what I find is people are afraid of us because they don't know how to communicate with us. And then if we have a different language, it makes it even more complex and scary. We don't live a traditional eight to five. Uh, we work in shifts. We do things at different times. And so it really teaches people how to be very flexible when they're talking about serving community and transit services for the needs of all people. So Cindy, how, what about you? How did it go for you? Well, first of all, Angie, congratulations on being reelected as the chairperson. That is so impressive. And it's really an honor to get to sit across from a boundary buster, you know, somebody who's <laughs> making change and doing it in real time. That's, that's exciting. Um, so my name is Cindy Chavez. I serve on um, three different transit boards. I just ended my chairpersonship of the Valley Transportation Authority that is here in Silicon Valley, Santa Clara County, our um, congestion management agency, and it runs buses and light rail and invests in uh, heavy rail, including BART here in the community. I'm also a member of the board of, our, of Caltrain, and Caltrain is a 77-mile, three-county venture that moves almost, I, I forget the number, but it's, it's thousands of people a day, approximately almost 60-something thousand pre-COVID. Um, and I just got appointed to our Metropolitan Transportation Commission, which is our nine Bay Area County um, Commission. What's really exciting about all of that that I just said, and just speaking of women in leadership, we have a, a Panamanian woman who is the head of the Valley Transportation Authority, who's also the president of APTA this year, um, and that is Noria Fernandez. And the head of our Metropolitan Transportation Commission is a woman by the name of Teresa McMillan, who both served in the federal government, previously served for this agency, but now is the head of it. Um, and we just appointed, or a woman was just appointed to be the um, interim chair, um, the interim director of Caltrain named Michelle Bouchard. So we really are seeing women leading in this community and women of color and LGBTQ women. So this is an exciting time, I think, to be in transportation. Just real briefly, the point you raised about like how, you know, I, I will say that um, I grew up taking the bus and I, I don't think I fully appreciated that, that the bus and BART um, connecting me to high school and college, um, I don't think I fully appreciated as we're talking about equity that one of the great equalizers in our community you know, we all talk about that being education, but the ability to get from one place to another to connect to opportunities for so many people only happens because of public transportation. And so this is a really fabulous time to be engaged in transit and really digging into issues of equity, um, both related to transit dependent communities, but also how that fits into environmental justice. So anyway, I'm just thrilled to be in the to be in the world right now and to be able to be um, part of our transportation movement. I think it's really exciting work as well. And, it, you know, one of the questions that I had been thinking about was, you know, like, what are some of the key issues in our community, like education, housing, and how does transit play a role in serving them? And in 2004, I was appointed to be on the RTD Board of Directors by then Mayor John Hickenlooper. And I remember thinking, um, I, I don't know why I need to be on a transit board, you know, because I'm serving my community. And um, after several people calling me and saying, we need that voice at the table, then, then I got there and started really digging in and figuring out that this was my opportunity to make policy for everybody. And that was an incredible gift to be able to, to have, right? But it, in my community where we're at, um, 
there are 15 board members and we represent something like 3.1 million constituents in the metropolitan area. And really before pre-COVID, we um, had about 95,000 boardings a day. I mean, huge. We're down 60 to 65% now as all transit agencies are dealing with this COVID issue. And I think my community, like so many other communities, are dealing with some really difficult issues. Housing, affordable housing, um, housing around transit systems, like what does that look like? And is it affordable for everybody or for just those who can, can pay market mm -hmm. rates? Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. The second thing is looking at these first last mile components. So transit is a huge issue, but if there isn't a feeder bus coming in, how can people access it equitably? And so really looking at first last mile. So RTD was like the first transit agency in the country to partner with Uber to do first last mile kind of components. But, you know, we are introducing electric bikes. We're doing all kinds of van pools and car pools. And I think that that's what's happening in terms of here is that we're looking at collaborations and partnerships in order to serve the greater need. When I think of RTD, um, you know, we serve just under 2,400 square miles, which is about the size of the state of Delaware. And, you know, it's mind blowing to think that, you know, we have just around 10,000 bus stops. Um, and then, you know, we have a commuter rail system and we have a light rail system and then we have free mall shuttle rides. It is a very diverse and complex in the products that we provide this community. And because we're such a big geographic area, it's really cumbersome to really evaluate all of them to make sure you're meeting the needs of everybody. And so we do we evaluate all of them three times a year in January, May and um in July. And so it is something that we're constantly evaluating as we move forward. This year feels very, very different. Um, we are getting ready to lay off a great number of people at the regional transportation district because of our funding and our, our tax revenue going down and our, um, and our, you know, our funding going down. And so um, it's something that we need to work on together as a whole community, not just transit agencies anymore. It's going to take all of us. And, um, but it's also a very exciting time of innovation and partnerships. And I think for the first time, people are starting to realize just how very important transit is to the economy. It truly is the economic backbone. You're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. If people cannot get to where it is they need to get to, then they can't succeed in what their goals and expectations are. Um, are you finding that to be true? You know, Angie, it's so, I, I think that's such an important point that you're raising. And and the thing that I think that, that maybe, you know, that maybe as a, as leaders in, in the transportation and trans, transit movement that we have to think much more about is how we share the opportunities that come with transit. And in particular, if you think about everything from economic prosperity for and economic access to being able to move goods and services within a region uh, in a timely way to fighting climate change. Because if you think about it, one of the most interesting, in my mind, one of the most interesting things about transportation and transit in general is that we have an opportunity to address so many issues at the same time, right? Climate change, educational access, access to healthcare, access to jobs. You know, access to, to goods and services and to be able to create regions that that um, easily allow for the movement of, of goods, particularly in areas like ours and, and yours that are really epicenters of innovation. And then I want to balance all of that to how do we build innovation that maintains an eye toward prosperity and you know, and and what that mean? What does that mean in an in an economy that reinvents itself? Frankly, by making sure that um, you're paying less for everything, right? And so, like you're struggling, Angie, as we are with these really strained budgets, um, and 
and yet we you know we we've got to figure out what is the new new thing that um doesn't disenfranchise folks and i love you know i'll tell you rtd i've, I've been a fan i've gone out to learn more about your system for a while and so your point about electric bikes you know we're doing similar things um you know scooters and one of the interesting things here is that we're finding is that the lap, first and last mile, that people are less likely to get into a car if they have access to an electric bike, which makes sense, right? Because people want the ultimate flexibility and freedom. You don't want to wait and you can go a little farther on them. So I think there's a lot to learn in our industry as well. Yeah, I, I, I do too. You know, the other thing that I think it's really interesting that people always ask is, you know, um, how do you bring your lived experience to a board and um, how are Latina leaders influencing those conversations and actions at the board level? And I have to tell you, I'm the only Latino on the RTD board of directors. Um, mm -hmm. And the other thing I'll tell you is I'm the only Latino on the senior leadership level. And so it says to me, we have a lot of work to do when we represent 22% of the transit population, our voice definitely needs to be at the table. But as you know, even in the Latino communities, we're very, very diverse in our, mm -hmm. um, in our cultures and our beliefs and how we live our lives. And so I think that transit agencies around the country, and um, I was just at a board talk for APTA and the whole uh, conversation was about equity. And it was like, how are we going to get people with diverse backgrounds on transit boards? And one of the big issues is we need to be flexible so that they can be on transit boards. And um, it reminds me that I did not run for an elected office until my girls were grown because mm -hmm. it took so much time and I really wanted to commit to that, right? But when you're working three jobs, it's really hard to run as an elected official or to be appointed to any board because all you're doing is trying to make ends meet and get food on the table. But I think what it does is it allows us as transit leaders to really stop and evaluate our work and how we are being inclusive and how we're reaching out to, to different communities. And I think that's going to be really important in this, not just this next year, but in these next five years. It's a real big issue for me at RTV. What about you? You know, Angie, I, um, I so appreciate that we all come to public service at different times in our lives. And, um, and you know, I'm, I am a mother of one child and my husband and I um, really accidentally decided to get into public service. I really was very active in the labor movement and I was active getting really good people elected to office. And my husband and I bought a home in downtown San Jose and um, we had, we just moved in, just moved in, and um, we were having challenges with a neighbor, and those challenges resulted in a in a shooting one night where no one was hurt, but my house got shot, and my husband, um, you know, was the one who called the police and was telling me, "Don't turn on the lights, honey." And and I'll tell you, I literally found the bullet from this shooting in our bed the next oh, uh, that night. And so that actually got me like really fired up. And I remember just being like, okay, you know, I'm, I've been interviewing all these candidates. I'm really excited that they um, think they can change the world. But the one person who I know is going to fight tooth and nail is going to be me. And that's ultimately, ultimately why I ran for office. And to your point, I think that what what is so wonderful about having people of different ages and different backgrounds is that you bring very different perspectives. And I'm sure you've done that in your agency. Um, but like right now we're hiring a lot of young people. And so we were trying to figure out how to do outreach on this new transportation plan. And it was really, you know, and you know, of course the 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 um, younger folks are very good at social media, but we started to do teletown halls actually before COVID-19. Way more people tuned in and then we did and that was for the more tech savvy and then we did pop up um, survey sites along in uh, along our bus routes and then got on the buses and started interviewing people. And my point there is, is that I think that the more voices we bring that the better opportunity we have to make these services meaningful for our community. And that's that, you know, whether that's my voice or others. And 
you know, as a young mom, I had a different perspective than I do now. And, you know, so all of those perspectives are really valid. And I think that's why your point about how do, how do the boards we sit on really reflect the community has to be a priority for each of us, including the boards and commissions that give in, input, right? right. Um, and so, yeah, so what one, one of the other things I'll say is with one of my colleagues um, here has put together a, a transportation mentoring network that all the women leaders here are involved with, where they're getting younger women in transportation and helping them figure out how to move up in their institutions so that they can play more of a leadership role. And I think that's the kind of the responsibility we have that, you know, Angie, I'm sure people helped you and you might have a couple of those folks in mind as you're thinking about it. I know I had women helping me even before I knew it. They were mentoring yeah. me in spite of my pig headedness. They were helping me be successful. Uh, so anyway, those are some of the things that I, I, I've been investing in. And I, I guess I'd be curious about you know, how, how based on the needs in your community, are you thinking about, you know, the, um, you know, that what's working in terms of outreach models of governance? I'd be just curious because, you know, RTD is so ahead of the, you guys really are ahead of most of us because of your multi-county, multi-regional um, approach. It's really fabulous. Yeah, I think, you know, I think that that's the million dollar question. How, how do you get different voices at the table and how do you with people in different areas. I think that um, we are very, very diverse, just like all transit agencies are. But when I think about um, all the things that you were talking about, how you do telephone town hall meetings, we do that as well. But I think that you, you hit the nail on the head by going to bus stops and talking to people there to find out what they think and how, um, how transportation is, is really impacting their daily lives. And because when I think about it, really all people want is to go to their bus stop and have a bus there. They don't care about anything else. They, they're they busy. They want to pay their fare. They want to get on the bus and they need to get on with what it is they need to get on with. And um, I do ride the bus all the time in the trains and I'm always fascinated listening to all the conversations in there because you can learn so much by just listening. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's been a really big um, success model for me is listening. And then, you know, some of my constituents have become some of my best friends. I'll call them and say, what do you think about this? And they tell me for sure, you know, uh, we are accessible by, you, you know, all kinds of things. And you're right, RTD has been a leader. Um, you know, in 2012, we started the Workforce Now Initiative, which we're hiring community members to build out our commuter rail lines. And it was unprecedented. And um, it empowered the community. But not only that, it gave them a, a livable wage to build out this infrastructure that was going to serve generations because of their work. And nobody knew that community better than them. And I think that's the secret sauce is actually going to the community that you're in and, and hiring them to do the work as we move forward and giving them the ability to be trained in all of these different facets that are going to serve them and their families for a very, very long time. So that's one thing. The second thing, you know, we do have a civil rights division. We consistently look at everything we do to have an SBE and a DBE component so that we're making sure that our workforce is very, very diverse. And then the last thing I'm gonna to say to you is we just had an election and we had uh, eight seats up for election, five brand new board members and three incumbents. And the five new board members, um, three of them, um, four of them are in their thirties, they're young um, and they're, they are psyched. They want to change the world. They have all these amazing ideas. They're extraordinarily um, efficient in the world of IT and social media like I am not. And um, I find it extraordinarily refreshing that they're there and that we're going to be working together. But I also think the other equation is us um, imparting on them our experience of wisdom that they can take and build on for their generation. Um, and, and I think that that's really exciting. We do need to go out. We do need to recruit younger folks to come on. 
But we also need to look at the diversity. We need to get people at the table who struggle so that, you know, it's not just people who, who have made it, but people who are still climbing up that ladder who can really give you a completely different ground kind of experience um, that you may not have or know. And I, like you, have been an, um, an advocate in my community. And actually, my community was one of the four communities in the in the state of Colorado that was deemed one of the most uh, dangerous during the summer of violence. We had a lot of gang violence. And as a single mom with two little girls, I got very involved. And the reason I did was just because of the way that you did it. I wanted to have my finger on the pulse. But more than that, I wanted police officers to fill out their reports in my alley so that I had more protection. I mean, I learned that through volunteering and getting to know people, they listen to you. And so I think that that's exciting. And I think all of that transfers into transportation because it is the nucleus of what we're going to do and how we're going to be moving forward as a community. You know, and I, I, just one of the things you you touched on that I, that just made me think a little bit about you know you know the opportunities and that you know transportation is it's such an interesting thing because a, a lot of times people think of climate change and the economy on opposite ends and transportation is such a great example of how you building the green economy literally the backbone of that green economy is investing in transit. And and you know obviously um, electric cars and other things, but but when you think about it, it, it really is a really incredible opportunity for us to do to do more and and again to be able to spend a tax dollar with multiple outcomes, greening the economy, paying a decent wage, and then helping people build career ladders. And you know at VTA, one of the things that we did. Um, I think in about 2010, I, I, I was on the board in 1999 actually, served for eight years and then um, went on to work back in the labor movement. I actually ran for mayor of San Jose in 2005 and I, I lost. And what was interesting about that at that time, I didn't realize that how few Latina mayors there were in the country. I had just assumed, I you know, I, you don't think about yourself in that, you know, always in those terms. but. But my, my, my bigger point there is that um, we, what we did there is we created an internal um, workforce ladder. So if you came in as a janitor or a maintenance uh, and you wanted to get into maintenance, we helped do the training that got you there or to become a bus driver. And it really created opportunities for more and more women to get into um, more stable jobs in the transportation industry. And it's a partnership, it's a joint workforce uh, partnership between the Valley Transportation Authority and the labor movement in our communities. And one of the things that we've done is we've even trained people to put up the wiring uh, for, um, light rail so those instead of hiring uh external you know doing contracts we're able to hire people from our community and let them um maintain and build that out and so i you know one of the things that i i'm just really this this conversation is reminding me is that you know as we think about the new administration and just the amount of money they've already put into um the Congress has already put into saving and protecting the the um, transportation infrastructure nationally, that there's an opportunity to have a, a so many rates of return with every investment dollar that gets made in transportation. So I think it's really exciting. And I'm, I'm excited to think, to see what they're gonna be doing and lobby them to invest more and more and more. <laughs> that's, that's gonna be my hat I'm wearing for a bit. I'm right there with you. In fact, um, I was having a conversation earlier this afternoon about uh, the Biden transition team and uh, Mayor Buttigieg understanding the grassroots issues of transit issues and just transportation issues, particularly in communities of diversity that have, have really struggled historically. And, you know, RTD has a pretty good sized fleet of electric vehicles. But what we're lacking is the infrastructure. And mm -hmm. I think that this is our opportunity with the new administration to start talking about new innovations like, can we be supportive of each other to do infrastructure where we have 
places where buses can get off and, and recharge and do all those things. Those are the things that I think we need to do next in order to elevate the climate kind of component. So if we have electric vehicles, we're not doing emis- you know, any of kind of these emission things that, that are happening that really affect our VMT, but that we get more clean air things happening. And so I think it's pretty exciting stuff that we're about to go into. I'm really looking forward to it. Angie, what do you think of, you know, one of the things that we've been thinking a lot about here in our community, and it's something I've been thinking about just being, because I I also serve as, I'm a member of the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors, and, you know, one of the emphasis I've been making with our staff is is to protect and maintain public right-of-way and public ownership of those right-of-ways and not selling public assets. And one of the things that I think is really interesting, again, as we think about innovation, is maintaining the um, the highways and the freeways, because irrespective of what's going to go on them long term, right, whether that's hovercraft, electric vehicles, air taxis, whatever it is, that the ability to make sure that the, the public can stay connected, in my mind, the protective thing that we need to do is make sure that those public assets stay public assets, and that when we do P3s, that you know, P3s don't mean give away public assets, that what it really means is that we use the public asset to lever- leverage a private investment that has a long-term rate of return and a, and a cap, right, so that we're not putting people at the whims of, of, um, of uh, you know, rates of return so that we're a- really able to capture the value add, keep that value add, but make sure that people can stay connected. And I'm wondering, are you having those discussions and debates um, you know, in, in uh, Colorado now. I think you just touched the live wire here. Um, my community, my district has the Central 70 project going through it. Central 70 is the major highway um, that was put into place in the 60s. And what it did was it split the community in half um, without uh-huh. the community's voice involved. Well, now they are re, um, redoing Central 70 because um, it is in such disrepair. And um, I've been involved with these discussions since 2002, and it has become a national um, model of how not to exclude disenfranchised communities. The Globeville, Swansea, O'Leary is predominantly Latino. Um, the average income for a family of four is like $12,000. This is wow. a very low income. It is a historical neighborhood. They've been there since the 1800s. There are still slaughterhouses and linen programs. And I mean, this is like how Denver started, right? And it's with um, communities of diversity. And it has been an extraordinary experience to be part of this. And um, the Colorado Department of Transportation Um, did a series of workshops and meetings with communities, but community was very angry. Um, They felt like they were being pushed out. Their land value was going up exponentially, and they were being pushed out of their neighborhood. They were being gentrified, and uh, they have fought back. They've actually put together um, a land trust coalition. They've educated themselves. Uh, They got funding to hire a consultant to come in and help them um, go to city council and get funding to do seed money to start building their own affordable housing. And I think those are the kinds of innovations and ganas that we call, you know, Mm -hmm. that that Mm -hmm. inside you, you're going to fight to preserve our homes and our community because it's not just where they live. It's an extension of of their history and um, they don't want to let that go. And it's been um, really humbling to see them fight to make sure that even though there are all of these brand new developments going on, there are tons of market rate apartments, but the developers are also working with them to give them uh, space to have meetings. They're doing some affordable units, tiny steps, but we're going, I think we're working together in unison. But the thing that they did that I thought was very interesting is the highway went over the community and it was um, one of the highest polluted neighborhoods in the country. And in fact, 
80216 was the, the highest polluted community in the country. Wow. And we had an unprecedented amount of, of kids and families with asthma and cancers and stuff. What they're doing is they're dropping the um, highway down underneath the community. And then on top, they're building a brand new park for the community. Okay. And it's going to be extraordinary. In fact, they're doing it right now. We are in year three of a five-year plan to, to finish that out. So with that we've started talking about things like walking biking and where is transit in all of this because this is clearly a transit dependent community and the need for it isn't just that they need a new bus stop it is that this is their livelihood to get to wherever it is they're also a food desert they need services they need transit um and and it's our job to make sure that they're being served so um, I know exactly what you're talking about in the sense that we really need to start not just being innovative. We need to be taking a look at those who don't have anything and have been left behind and making sure that we're respecting who they are and protecting them from, you know, um, being left out. Here in our county, one of the things that we've been working on, and it's it's interesting to hear you hear talk about that, that's a, that's a very powerful story and really it sounds like my guess is there's a lot of powerful women behind all that organizing. There is. Um, we in, in our community in, in 2016 passed a housing bond, a $950 million housing bond with a majority of the money going to extremely low and very low income households. Because here we built a lot of, um, uh, we built very little affordable housing relative to all the housing starts in California. But um, you know, one of the things that is really challenging is a family of four to be able to thrive in our community needs to make about $120,000 a year. That's on the low end. And we have housing, uh, you know, rents for a two bedroom apartment are in the even now in the three or $4,000 range, even during COVID-19. They've dropped a little in San Francisco, but in Silicon Valley, the prices haven't dropped. And so, you know, so we're we're really trying to um, working with community leaders build as much housing as possible and make it affordable. And what's fascinating to me is one how challenging that's been because everybody wants to not see homeless people, but they don't want them housed in their community. So we have that balance of a very generous community. Our our, our folks um, voted, you know, over two thirds to have this housing bond. Um, and so anyway, we're working really hard to build that affordable housing. Um, so one of the things that we did is in partnership with the Valley Transportation Authority and with Caltrain is we put in um, affordability uh, targets. So for all the housing that we're building next to stations, 35% of it has to be low or very low or, or extremely low income. And it can be balanced, right? Like the entity can still make money over a long period of time, again, because we don't want to sell assets, but we want to make sure that that we're doing what's good for the community and, and making those investments over an extended period of time. So that 35% can be shared over particular projects or properties. And we, we put that in about the same time that we voted on our last, um, we're a self-help county, we, we've taxed ourselves to build out BART and um, to invest in Caltrain and to invest in roadway improvements and the like. Uh, so we'll know more, you know, like we're in the process now of doing RFPs and RFQs for sites around our transit districts with this 35% uh, requirement. Some of the money to offset that is coming from the housing bond so that we can build in the extremely low and very low income housing and have it be, you know, two or three bedrooms so that you also have opportunities for families to be able to live near transit. So that's on our to do list. Wow, I, I think that's all of our to-do list, our transit-oriented development. There are uh, several projects that um, have Section 8 housing next to it now that I think is really, um, we're going to have to be looking at those kind of components, right? And um, and I, I agree with you. I think that uh, it's going to take those kinds of programming to make sure that we are serving our most vulnerable populations. In Denver, we have... Um, 
you know, the unhoused community. And Denver is doing some innovative kinds of components. They have found a couple of pilot projects where they're taking parking lots of churches um, and they're putting up um, micro units, kind of like little micro units for people to be able to feel safe. That's one thing. The second thing is we are seeing more and more people living in their cars. They're finding parking lots where they can park overnight and not be hassled and then have a place to go in and take a shower and use the restroom. So, I mean, I think we're having to look at all, everything we can possibly get in our toolbox and expanding it because things have changed drastically and the um, affordability of housing is just gone. It's gone. Mm -hmm. And we got to mm -hmm. figure out how to ring this in. I think that's going to be really important across the whole country for all of us. But I'm really excited about your 35%. I'm going to be calling you and checking up on We'll that. send you the policies. Yeah. You know, we, we, we try to swap with good, smart women like you all over the country because, you know, all these new ways of thinking, you know, we're, we want to help out. So yeah, we'll make yeah. sure we share that with you. I know we're getting close to the end of the time we get to spend together, but um, maybe I'll just say to you, Angie, just how much I appreciate getting an opportunity to talk to such a dynamic, smart, vibrant leader. And it gives me great hope for the future of transportation that we have uh, women like you um, in leadership. And here in um, Silicon Valley, as we're struggling through COVID-19, you know, the thing that I'm, I'm in, and really even the times, you know, as we're we're just on the on the heels of the this very bumpy transition in power in our country, um, it is a reminder to me that leaders of goodwill at every level of government um, couldn't be more needed than we are right now. So thanks for letting me spend time with you. Cindy, the same to you. I am so grateful to meet you. And I think that your leadership is an inspiration to to me and, and thousands of women and for you know all of the women listening on this podcast particularly young young folks and young latinas we need you we need you at the table we need you to get educated and we need you to call us um and uh, tell us if you need information because that's our job is to to give you all the wisdom that we've learned but to understand that we can learn from you as well. But Cindy, what a pleasure. Um, I look forward to working with you. I'm gonna be calling you and um, I'll see you out there in transit, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And thanks for joining us. The Talking Headways podcast is a project of The Overhead Wire on the web at theoverheadwire.com. Sign up for a free trial of the Overhead Wire Daily, our 14-year-old Daily Cities news list, by clicking the link at the top right of theoverheadwire.com. And please, please, please support the pod on patreon.com slash theoverheadwire. Many thanks to our current patrons for their ongoing support. And as always, you can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Overclass, Spotify, and wherever you get your podcasts. And you can always find its original home at usa.streetsblog.org. See you next time at Talking Headways.